As Callum has already mentioned, we're going to uh, look at um, Acts chapter 14 this afternoon. Um, the last two weeks we've been in chapter 13, and what we have in, in chapter 13 and 14 uh, of the Acts of the Apostles is what has been referred to as Paul's first missionary uh, journey. And uh, I'll just try and share my screen just for a minute. Uh, and you get some kind of idea of the distances that Paul and his and Barnabas travelled on that first uh, missionary journey. So I'll just see if I can share my screen. Um, yeah, that should be it there. So that, that really gives you some idea of the... Uh, distance that they travelled. On the right-hand side, you've got uh, Antioch of Syria, uh, up the top there where the red lines have come out from the coastline, and that is where they, they started their uh, missionary journey. They, of course, have been commended from the, the church in, in Antioch, and uh, along with uh, Barnabas and John Mark, uh, Saul, uh, Paul, uh, the apostle, Saul of Tarsus, he set sail uh, from the coast there of Syria. He travelled across to Cyprus, and we looked at that in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the book uh, in chapter 13, and we saw some of the events that took place in Cyprus, and then um, we discovered that uh, they moved across the sea uh, up into what is now modern-day Turkey, and um, the, uh, John Mark left them and made his way back to Jerusalem, and uh, Paul and Barnabas continued their journey, as you see, as they move right into uh, Turkey and they move right up into uh, the area of Lystra and Derby. Uh, now, they reckon that they were away for about uh, 12 to 18 months, so a year to a year and a half uh, this trip took. Uh, they travelled approximately 1,500 miles. Uh, no doubt most of that was on foot, although there was obviously a uh, part of it was done by ship, uh, but most of that would have been in foot. And as they left the, the coastline of Turkey and made their way into interior uh, Turkey, they would have uh, been traveling in some uh, pretty rough uh, countryside, uh, up and down mountain passes uh, and areas where they were, they were really faced with tremendous dangers. And so there they were, away for about 18 to 18 months to about eight, uh, 12 months to about 18 months, uh, traveling about 1,500 miles. Uh, we know, of course, that Paul took uh, three different uh, missionary journeys. We'll read about them in the remainder of the Acts of the Apostles. And then there was his final journey uh, when he was taken uh, right across to Rome itself, where he was imprisoned and eventually he was executed. Uh, they reckon the total distance of the journeys that uh, the Apostle Paul took uh, in his labours for the Lord Jesus were over 10,000 miles, which is quite incredible to think that these were the kind of um, journeys, the length of the journeys that he took, three uh, missionary journeys, and then his final journey to Rome, and in total, uh, around about 10,000 miles uh, were travelled, most of it by foot, but obviously some of it uh, by by sea, by by ship. Uh, now there was no GPS signalling, uh, no mobile phones. Uh, there was no uh, trains. There was no cars. There was no bicycles. Uh, there was no tarmacadam road. Everything was pretty primitive. Everything was pretty rough, and they would be uh, basically. Um, on their own, without any contact with the church back in Antioch, without any contact with friends, and yet they, they just laboured on the uh, progress of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. You know, just things are just so different for, uh, for us, us today. In many ways, things are just so easy for us, and yet we lack that courage, that boldness, and that zeal uh, that marked not only these early missionaries, uh, Paul and Barnabas and others who joined them in subsequent visits and subsequent journeys, but, you know, maybe we even lack the, uh, the, um, the, the boldness uh, that missionaries, Christians of a, of a former generation had. 
Now, when Mary and I lived in Galston, we were very friendly with the late Margaret Allison, who was the wife of the late Bobby Allison or Crawford Allison, uh, who labored in Central Africa for a lifetime uh, in Angola and then in Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, and spent some time at Botswana as well. Now, Mrs. Allison would tell us there was times when her husband and his co-worker, George Wiseman, and a few of the local believers would simply leave the mission compound where they lived, and they would disappear into the bush, and there would be no communication for weeks and end, and maybe months later, they would suddenly reappear out of the bush and walk back into uh, the mission station. And Mrs. Allison was there in the mission station with bringing up a, a young family and and, and and obviously with the other missionaries' wives. But as far as their husbands were concerned, they had just gone boldly at the call of God into the bush to seek to win men and women for the Lord Jesus Christ. That is true missionary zeal and missionary courage and missionary endeavor. It's so easy for us to jump onto uh, British Airways or Emirates Airways or Qatar Airways and make our way uh, all over the world and spend a few weeks here and come back and, and think we've been on a missions trip. <laughs> we think we've been on a missions trip. We've preached a few messages. We've stayed in some nice hotels. We've, uh, we've traveled in, on massive air aircraft and, and we come back and and, you know, we've got all the photographs to show for it. And I've been there many times. But, you know, I hang my head in shame as I think of the, the zeal and the courage and the dogged determination of Saul of Tarsus and Barnabas. And, and I think of the endeavours of men like Bobby Allison and George Wiseman and men like Hudson Taylor and uh, various men over the course of the last century have taken the gospel uh, to lands afar who have hazarded their lives for the sake of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And the tragedy is that for many of us, and I speak to my own shame, there's times when we're almost afraid to name the name of Jesus and to preach the gospel to the people in our own community because we don't want to be laughed at. We don't want to feel the rejection. And so often we remain dumb. And so often we're silent rather than speaking forth the name of Jesus and declaring the gospel. And yet we think of, we think of Saul of Tarsus. We think of Bobby Allison. We think of, of Hudson Taylor. We think of uh, Adairam Judson. And, and we could go on and on and on. And we think of those who, were, who boldly went where no one else had gone before, just the herald the message of the gospel. What we'll see in Acts chapter 14 is really what we've seen uh, previously in the book of Acts. There seemed to be a pattern that developed as far as the, uh, the work and the ministry of the early Christians. You know, they, when they moved into a new area, their, their first port of call was really the synagogue. And that's where they started proclaiming the message of the gospel. But remember, uh, Paul would remind us to the, in the Roman epistle that the gospel was to the Jew first and then it was to the Gentiles. And that's the pattern that we find in the Acts of the Apostles. It went, the gospel went to the Jews first. It was taken to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. So they would go to the synagogue and they would preach the gospel. We saw that in chapter 13, that as they visited the, uh, the, 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 uh, the synagogue, that opportunity was given to, to speak a word. And they preached the gospel. And we noticed that when they preached the gospel, there was always a response. You know, brothers and sisters, if we're really preaching the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, then there must be a response. You, you, you read through the life of the Lord Jesus and you'll discover that when Jesus spoke, when Jesus ministered to men and women, there was no neutrality. It wasn't just a case of Jesus speaking and the words just falling to the ground and everybody just listened and went home. No, there was a response when he spoke. There was a response when the, when the early apostles preached the gospel. There was a positive response. Praise God, there were those that received it. But, you know, there was so often a negative response. And those that rejected it were, were fired up with hatred and hostility 
against the, the messengers of the gospel. And that's what we see again in, in this chapter, that they go to the synagogue and, and the Jews reject it. So they go and they appeal to the Gentiles and a few receive Christ as their savior. And there's a little nucleus believers gather together and a church is formed. And then there's the disturbance, there's the persecution. And normally the persecution is stirred up by the religious Jews, those that had rejected the Messiah. His blood be on us and on our children. And they're still filled, the whole nation is filled with hatred against the Christ. And so they stir up this hatred, they stir up this opposition against the gospel. And so often they just, they get the, the Gentiles, and we see it in this chapter as we'll go down it in a minute, and they get the Gentiles involved. Strange, isn't it? That they're quite happy to have fellowship with the Gentiles in a riot, but they won't sit and eat with them. And they won't pray with them. And yet they'll incite them and they'll join with them in order that they might riot against the message of the gospel. And we'll notice that after these persecutions, we see that the, the preachers, they move on to pastures new. They move on to new ground to preach the gospel there as well. And that's the pattern that is established. And that's the pattern that we see right through the whole of the Acts of the Apostle. But, you know, in, in verse number one, we, we have the, the, the progress of the gospel. Uh, he's been in Cyprus and they've moved across and and they're, they're now in, in Turkey. And it says it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together, Paul and Barnabas, into the synagogue of the Jews. And so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. And here Paul and, and Cyrus, uh, Paul and, and, and Barnabas, they had, they had been persecuted at the end of chapter number 13. They'd known what it was to... Uh, to see the, the crowd being stirred up against them. And they move out of their midst and they shake the dust from off their feet. And undaunted and unbowed, they move on. They move on with the gospel. You know, as far as these men were concerned, it was the, the world was their mission field. There was no distance that they weren't prepared to go. There was no effort that they weren't prepared to expend. There was no suffering that they weren't prepared to endure. The gospel must be preached. Brothers and sisters, that's the spirit of missions that must grip my heart afresh and grip all our hearts. Just that burning desire to make Christ known regardless regardless of the hardships and the sufferings and the rejections that it might bring upon us. And so they make their way to Iconium. Uh, you know, someone has said that the way led over savage mountains, but the two brethren tramped along with an unseen third between them. And that presence made the road light. If they looked with the eye of sense, they had little to cheer them in their prospects, but they were in good heart and the remembrance of Antioch did not embitter them or discourage them. They never looked behind. They never considered as it were their losses. They never thought of their past sufferings at Antioch or anywhere else. They just moved on, moved on. They never took the easy road. They never, they never uh, preserved and protected themselves from the hardships and the difficulties, but they just moved on with this burning passion within their hearts, with a divine purpose before their minds. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, brothers and sisters, that commission, the commission given by the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 80, uh, 28 has never been rescinded. It's never been recalled. That commission comes to you and to I this afternoon with a responsibility to reach out, regardless of the personal hardships and the personal sufferings and difficulties and deprivations, to move on and move out with the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, we not only have the pattern that developed and the progress of the gospel, but again in verse 1, we've got the preaching and its effect. It says they so spoke, they so spoke that many, that many, a great multitude believed. They so spoke, they, they spoke plainly. 
They spoke convincingly. They preached. They, they spoke compassionately. They spoke powerfully. They spoke with an evident concern for the souls of men and women. And they preached with the evident attendant power of the Holy Spirit and many, a great multitude, believed. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, oh, that our preachers would so speak. Oh, that I and my ministry would so speak. Speak plainly, speak convincingly, speak with authority, speak with compassion, speak with the attendant power of the Holy Spirit, and that men and women might believe, that they might respond to the, the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the preaching of the gospel is not the telling of little stories. It's not just telling a story and giving a little, a little application. It's the presentation of Christ and the cross and the resurrection and the exaltation and the coming glory of the Lord Jesus. It's an exaltation of him. And we must preach him and we must preach him uh, Christ crucified and Christ risen and Christ glorified and Christ alone as the only hope for the salvation of men. And don't preach it apologetically. And don't preach it with any sense of any sense of the fact that the message is inferior to any other message, because there is no other message like the message of the gospel of the grace of our Lord Jesus, the most powerful, dynamic message that the world has ever heard. And oh, that we may be unashamed of it. Paul says, I'm unashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. Oh, that we might be unashamed of the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And so we have the preaching and its effect. We come into verse two and we've got the, the persecution that was endured, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Here we've got the same pattern. The Jews stirring up the Gentiles. You know, it's the strange bedfellows. The Jews had no dealing with the Gentiles, Gentile dogs, and yet they become friends. They become one in their opposition against the gospel and against the servants of the cross of the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, what they really did was they just poisoned their mind, poisoned their mind. What does it say? It says that they, they, they made their minds evil affected against the brethren. They just poisoned their minds. Brothers and sisters, that's a dangerous thing, isn't it? That's a horrible thing. And you know, the reality is that we can be guilty of that. You and I can be guilty of just poisoning people's minds against certain people. And I just want to underline that wee practical point in the way through this afternoon. You know, we need to be very careful how we use our tongue and how we speak about people. We can just sow little seeds into people's minds, seeds, seeds of doubts about a person's character. And it doesn't really matter whether it's true or, or whether it's no. We just, we, just get, we, just, we just sow seeds and we just cause people to be suspicious about certain individuals. And, and really, we're just bringing people down. We're really just destroying their character and destroy relationships and hinder the work of God. Oh, we need to be careful about the tongue. That little member, what does James say about it? He says, no man, no man, no man can tame it. Brothers and sisters, there's only one person that can, can, can tame our tongue, and it's the Lord himself, and how we need to surrender our very tongue to, to the Lord and ask him to take control of it, because so often we can use our tongue like these men did, just to poison the minds of other people against, against others. And, you know, so many servants of the Lord, you know, the, 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 the minds of men and women have been poisoned against them by those that, are, that, those that would oppose them. But we notice, you know, that this opposition wasn't it against Paul and Barnabas. It was against the brethren. It was against the, those that had received the gospel. You know, it's wonderful, isn't it? That the moment a person receives the gospel, receives Christ as their savior, they become part of the family, part of the family of God. They're, they're the brethren. They're, not, not a brethren with a great big B. Banish the thought of that. But, you know, it's, it's, it's brethren where we be. It's the whole family of God. And we're all part of it. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a beautiful thing. A family. 
And that's what every local church should really be. It really, really should be the, a family affair, that we're all brothers and sisters in the family, the family of God. And it was against the brethren, it was against these new converts that this, that this opposition was really, was really against. And so we notice that uh, Paul and Barnabas don't do here what they'll do later on in the chapter. And they don't do what they did at the end of the previous chapter, but they stayed. If the opposition had been against them, they might have moved on, but they're not going to leave these young Christians to bear the, the wrath of these, of these Jews and, and these Gentiles that have been stirred up. And no, Paul and Barnabas are going to, they're going to stay there. They're not going to abandon the, 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 the young babes in Christ. You know, they're going to stay. They're going to look after them. And it says that he spoke boldly. In verse number three, long time they abode and they spoke boldly in the Lord, spoke boldly in the Lord. You know, in the, in the, in the cause of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in dependence on the Lord, in the authority of the Lord. You know, these men weren't they, weren't they propagating some message that had, uh, that had been concocted by in their own minds. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're preaching the message of God. And they're preaching boldly with courage in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, oh, that we might, oh, that we might just realize that when we, when we hold this book and preach forth the truth of this book, that we're preach, that we might preach it boldly in the Lord, in the Lord, in his authority, in his power, in his cause, and for, for his glory. And we notice it says in verse number three that, that the Lord gave testimony unto the word of his grace. Brothers and sisters, that's what the gospel is. It's the word, it's the message of his grace, his grace. The subject of the message is grace. The origin of the message is, in, is, is grace. It, it, it originates in, in, the, in the gracious heart of God. It's the gift. The gift of the message is grace. It's all grace. It's all grace. And so Paul and Barnabas, they preach boldly in the Lord. And he gives witness through their preaching to the word, the word of his grace. Oh, brothers and sisters, oh, that we might, we might just appreciate grace tonight. It's all of grace. You know, all we see in the world around us, the world of religion, it's all of works. And oftentimes, you know, even that can creep into our lives and into our churches. And, 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 we, and we've got the idea that although we've, be, we've begun the Christian life uh, in response to the grace of God and sending Jesus to die for us, we think we can continue by our own works. Brothers and sisters, we're saved by faith and we're saved through grace and we continue in faith and we continue on the basis of grace. It's not of us. Nothing's of us. We were never saved by doing anything. And we don't continue by doing anything of ourselves, but yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit within us that by his grace, he will make us what he wants us to be. And he'll do with us and through, through us what he desires to accomplish. It's all the word of his grace. Grace is the subject of the meta message. Grace is the origin of the message. And grace is the gift that the message offers to men. And we'll notice that God, not, not, the Lord not only confirmed it, uh, gave testimony to the word of his grace, but he gave signs and wonders to be done by their hands. You know, it's interesting, we've said, we've said this before, that the miracles that were performed came as a confirmation to faith, not as the foundation to faith. These early Christians, yeah, they, there was many of them performed miracles and many more witnessed miracles. But the miracles that were done were not the basis of their faith. It was just the confirmation that their faith was truly of God. We're living in days when the, you know, we're, 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 we're just polluted with the signs and wonders movement. And people just get taken up with, with the, the signs and the wonders and the alleged miracles. And, and that is the basis of their Christianity. It's what they have seen done or what they have heard was done or maybe even what they've done themselves. Brothers and sisters, the miracles were a confirmation of faith. They weren't the foundation of their faith. 
But then we notice in verses four and five, we've got uh, Paul and Barnabas' pro prompt e exit, exit from, uh, from Iconium. Verse four says the multitude of the city was divided. Remember, it says that about the Lord Jesus, his preaching. There was a division among the people because of him in John's gospel. Brothers and sisters, the gospel always divides. So let's not shy away from it. It's a divisive message. It divides, it, it, it divides families. It divides, it divides homes. It divides community. There's always a division among the people because of Christ. The gospel divides. And, and so there's a division. There's a division here in Iconium. The multitude of the people of the city was divided. And there were part of them held with the Jews and part were the apostles. And where there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and of the Jews with the rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them. Verse 6 says they were, they were aware of it and they fled unto Lystra and De Derby. They made a prompt exodus. You know, the, 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 the brunt of the opposition is now coming upon them. And so they decide that for the cause of the gospel, it's time for them to to move on. And again, we have these two opposing parties uh, opposed to each other and yet united in their opposition against the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We see that with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were at loggerheads. You know, they were, they were, they were polar opposite as far as their doctrinal beliefs were concerned. And yet they were united. They were united in their opposition against Jesus. We think of Herod and Pilate. They were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were enemies, and yet they became united. Enemies united against the person of the Lord Jesus. And let's not be, let's not be surprised in, in our life, in our experience, when we see that those who are opposed to each other in the world, they've suddenly become united in their opposition against the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so opposing forces unite against the gospel. Someone has said if the churches, if the enemies of the churches can unite for its destruction, shall not friends lay aside all personal feuds and unite for its preservation? You know, sometimes we do the enemies work for them. Think of the whole church, think of the churches, not only through our own community, but through our land, throughout the world that are divided, marked by division. And each little group, you know, we, we, we gather around uh, some little title, some little banner that we think distinguishes us from all others. And, and we are holding to truth. And, and there's all these divisions and the world looks on in utter confusion. If the enemies of the cross of Christ can unite against it, surely the Christians can unite together and to stand united for the cause of Christ and the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we're all going to be one. We are all one in Christ. That's reality. And we're all going to be together in heaven. There's not going to be a place in heaven for, for Pentecostals and for Baptists and for Reformed and for, and, and, and for brothers and sisters. We're all going to be together because we're all part of the one family of God. Oh, that we might manifest something of that unity here and now and stand together in the declaration of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And so, so, Paul, so Paul and Barnabas, they, they move on. You know, someone said that Paul living to preach in the regions beyond was more useful than Paul lying dead in a street riot and in an Iconium. There's a, time to, there's a time to lay down your life and there's a time to, a time to flee. You know, Paul could say in another occasion, he says, I, count, I counted not my life dear unto me. He was prepared to lay it down, but he was only prepared to lay it down at the right time. God's time. Someone has said that an unnecessary martyr is a suicide. And brothers and sisters, Paul was conscious of the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit. And he wasn't, he wasn't afraid to suffer. And he wasn't afraid to die. But he would only suffer and die if he was conscious it was, in, it was in the timing and the will of God. Verse number six, we see the places that they entered. It says when they were aware of it, they fled from Lystra uh, and Derby. Cities of, of, of uh, they said to, they, they fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia and unto the region that, run, that, 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 that lies round about. The places that they entered. 
You know, that's what the Lord Jesus told his disciples, isn't it? In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 73, he says, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another, flee to another. Brothers and sisters, you trace the whole history of, of missions throughout the, the age of the church, and, and that's what they did. When they were persecuted in one place, they simply moved to another place and they preached the gospel and, and, and they moved on and they moved on in order that the, the area would be reached and saturated with the preaching of the message of divine grace. They're moving into a, a, an area that was much wilder and uncivilized, uh, an area that was cut off by, by mountains. Uh, from the more cultivated country of Cilicia and Pisidia that, that, that they'd been in. Uh, someone has said that the area that they went to, Lyconia, was described as a dreary plain, bare of trees, destitute of fresh water, and with several salt lakes. Lyconia was interpreted traditionally as wolfland, wolfland. And Paul and Barnabas in moving up into that area would lose all protection. There was no Roman protectorate in that area. You know, there was times when Paul uh, pulled the Rome cart and, you know, declared to those that would oppose him that he was a citizen of Rome. And that, that Roman citizenship gave, him, uh, citizenship gave him a degree of protection, but not here. <laughs> Paul, Paul and Barnabas are abandoning themselves to the, to the grace of God and the mercy of God and the protection of God in their life. Brothers and sisters, it's just, ah, oh, that we might have the, the faith of these men, the courage of these men, and just not to think of, not to think of ourselves, and, but just to think of others, to think of men perishing in their sins, and to think of the grace of God and the glory of God and the purpose of God, and just to be prepared to be sold out for the purpose of God in our lives. There's no indication that he preaches in any synagogues in these areas. But, you know, it seems as if he goes directly to the heathens because there would be no synagogues. And he starts preaching again the glorious message. Verses 7 to 10, we've got the power that was exhibited. It says that in verse 7, they preached the gospel. Verse 8 says, there sat a certain man at Lystra who was impotent in his feet being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never, who had never walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped and he walked. And so we see the power that was exhibited, not only in the preaching, but we see the power, not only in the message, but in the miracle. It's interesting, isn't it, that you know, you, you go back into the Gospels and and I suppose one of the first miracles that we kind of come to our mind as we think of the miracles of the Lord Jesus is the man at the pool, 38 years, lame on his feet, crippled. And the Lord Jesus says, rise, take up your bed and walk. And, and of course, we go into the, the ministry of Peter in the early part of the Acts. And is it chapter three of the beautiful gate of the temple? There's a cripple, a lame man. And Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto you. Rise, walk. And he went leaping and walking and praising God. And here we'll get a cripple here in, in, in Lister. In the area of Lyconia, you've got a cripple. A man that had never walked. A man who couldn't even put his weight on his feet. His feet were powerless. He'd never stood up. Never mind walk. He was a hopeless condition. And yet Paul looked at him and he perceived that this man had faith. I don't know, maybe Paul had spoken about, the, about, about what had happened in Jerusalem at the beautiful gate of the temple. Maybe in his preaching he'd referred to the man at the, at the, at the pool of Bethesda. And maybe whether it, was, whether it was spiritual discernment or whether it was just uh, looking at the man's face and seeing that sense of anticipation, that sense of excitement, that sense of acceptance. And, he, and Paul believed that this man had faith to believe. This man was just ready to receive the power of God in his life. And so he told him to, to rise up. And it says that he went leap, he went, he went, he went, he went uh, leaping and walking. He leapt and he walked. The leaping, the leaping was a once for all. The walking was continuous. Brothers and sisters, isn't the lesson simply this, that 
When a person receives Christ as their Savior, when a person responds to the gospel, it affects our walk. It affects our walk. And everybody can see the, the change in the walk of those who have responded to Christ. There's a change in our walk. You know, Paul, Paul would teach that in, 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 the, in the Ephesian epistle. You know, he tells us that we walk not according to the, 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 the ungodly. And then he'll tell us the, the various aspects of the walk of the believer in the later part of, of Ephesians. How that we should walk worthily, walking in light. Uh, not walking as the Gentiles walk. Brothers and sisters, the evidence of a person who had been truly saved, a, a true Christian, we're seen, in the, seen in the way we walk. Seen in the way we walk. You know, we, we hear so many people that, that claim to be Christians, and yet there's, there's no change in their life. Brothers and sisters, there's got to be a change in our life. The Holy Spirit, this man, this man was, was, was filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and it changed the way that he walked and the way that he lived. And brothers and sisters, there must be a change when a person receives Christ as their Savior and Lord. But we notice in verses 11 and 12, the people's excitement. Verse 11 says, and when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they call Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Wow, that's a strange thing, isn't it? Remember the Lord Jesus. Think of all the miracles that he did. And the people looked at him and they accused him of blasphemy. They said, you can never be God. <laughs> you're, just a you're just a peasant of Nazareth. You know, you were born of fornication. You're the son of the carpenter. And there was all the evidence laid out before them. The evidence of the deity, the divine power and glory of Jesus manifest and the deeds that he did. And they says, you're a blasphemer. You're an imposter. And yet here's Paul and Barnabas. And, they, and they, they, uh, one miracle is done in, 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 in Lister. And the people say, oh, these are gods. These are gods. And, you know, they're, they're going to offer a sacrifice to them in the next, next verses. And, you know, Jupiter, they, they, they call Barnabas Jupiter. And, and then Paul was Mercurius, the, the, the god of eloquence, the god who was, who was fluent in his speech. And, you know, they tried to deify them. But, you know, notice the response of, of, uh, of Paul and, 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 and uh, Saul, uh, Paul and Barnabas. It says in verse 14, when when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they rent their clothes. They ran in among the people crying, Sirs, why do, you, why do you do these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and we preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. You know, they, 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 were, they were astonished. They were they were, you know, they rent their clothes in indignation and abhorrence that they, they would ever try to confer the, 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 the position of deity upon them. They didn't want, they said, look, we're just the same as you. We're men of like passion. Remember, James says that Elijah was a man of like passions and he prayed earnestly and, 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 and the, the rain was, was held back from, from, from heaven and the land became barren. But you know, man, they said, we're just, we're just men. We're just the same. Uh, we, you know, we've, got to, we've got to eat and we've got to drink. You know, we've got to lie down and sleep at night. You know, we, we, you know, we're just like you. We've got the same passions, the same tendencies, the same instincts as you. We're just the same. Don't deify. Don't lift us up on a platform. Oh, that preachers today would learn that lesson. That would have the same spirit as Paul. You know, so often and, and we, we see preachers. You know, we're living in the days of the celebrity preacher. Oh, God, forgive us. Have mercy upon us as your people when we elevate men to the status of celebrity because of their ability to hold an audience, to sway a crowd. Brothers and sisters, the tragedy is that many of these celebrity preachers that we see on our television screens, you know, they, they love the adulation of men. They love the praise of men. And they love to be pampered and they love to, and they're proud. Brothers and sisters, oh, that we would realize that, that, that even the best of preachers, even the most godly of, godliest of men is only a man at the best. 
I know that we would take that humble place as Jesus took it. I think of Paul of uh, Paul and how he could speak about him, himself as being a born slave of Jesus Christ. Not imagine, not, he says not, he's not only saying that he's just a man of like passions as these peasants in, 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 in Lyconia. He says, but I'm just a born slave. I'm a born slave. I'm at the bottom of the pile. I'm just a born slave of Jesus Christ. I am nothing. Think of John the Baptist, the greatest of all the prophets. And yet he says, and we saw this just the other, the other week there, he says in relation to Jesus, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and, and unloose his feet, the, 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 the laces of his shoes, the laces of his sandals. He took the low place. Oh, that, he, oh, that, oh, that we would realize the, the honor of preaching the gospel, the, the privilege and the responsibility of being servants of the living God, but all that that would never elevate us above the people of God. You know, he's going to appoint elders in these churches that, that, that he saw formed in these different places that, that, that he visited. You know, but he's, he's going to appoint elders, a, plura, a, plurality, a plurality of elders. And, 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 you know, he'll tell us later on in his epistles that these elders are among the flock of God. They're not over the flock of God. They're not above them, but they're among them. They're among as those that serve, serve the flock. And brothers and sisters, the greatest servant, the most gifted servant of God is but a servant. A servant not only of God, but a servant of the people of God. And so Paul and, and Barnabas, they're, they're, almost, they're almost outraged by the thought that these men, it's interesting that you, they said they, they spoke in the, 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 the language of the, of the, the, uh, the, uh, the Lyconians. So probably Paul and Barnabas didn't realize what they were saying initially. It was only when the priest uh, of, of Jupiter in verse 13, when he started bringing out the oxen and putting the garlands on it, you know, brothers and sisters, oh, oh that we might just, oh, oh, that we might honor. We need to honor those that, those that labor among us. But brothers and sisters, we, we, we dare not deify them. We dare not put them up on a pedestal. I, I, I and think that they're any better than anybody else, or that we might just realise that that we're just servants at the very best, uh, and we're just men at the very the very best. We notice that he that he 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 preaches uh, that they should turn. He says, "Listen," he says, "he says we're telling you to turn away from all these vanities, all that emptiness. We're we're, we're preaching to turn away from idolatry. You know, but we're, we're teaching you to to turn to the living God." The living God. That's what he. That's what he says, isn't it? Uh, in verse number, in verse number fifteen, that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. That was what happened at Thessalonica, wasn't it? They turned to God from their idols to serve the living and true God, brothers and sisters. Our God is a living God. I know there are folks in in the call this afternoon from uh, India and some from Africa, and, I, and you know, in your nations, there are people that bow down to all kind of gods. Gods that get, gods that take, but gods that never give. Gods that, gods that never give. You know, people come and they put their offerings before the re altars and, and they're, they're, they're putting their food there and, and they're, they're, they're burning their incense there. And, and all these idols, do, all these gods do is just take from the people and impoverish them. But our God is a God that gives to his people and enriches them. And that's what he goes on to say, isn't it? Uh, he says, nevertheless, he says, oh, he says in verse 16, in time past, he, he, he's explaining the past in verses 16 and 18. He, he says, uh, in time past, he suffered all nations to walk in their ways. Nevertheless, he'd left not himself without a witness and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained, restrained the people that they had not done sacrifice Unto, unto them. So he's reminding them about, about the past history. You know, the past history is interesting because God only chose one nation in the Old Testament and he gave them, he gave them the law and, and he, he sent them the prophets. Uh, but, you know, to all the other nations, God, God never gave them that. He never gave them the law, a written law. He, he never gave them prophets uh, to instruct them, but he left man to... To, to do his own thing. Remember, Paul will say in, in Acts 17, as he, as he speaks in, the, in Athens, he'll say, you know, and the, 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 and the, the times past that uh, uh, man's ignorance, God winked at it, uh, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. What God shows in the Old Testament 
is that man left on his own will never seek after God. That man needs to, needs to have a divine revelation. Man needs an intervention from heaven in their lives. And that's what Paul will develop. It's interesting in these chapters, we see the kind of seed plot of what Paul will develop, particularly in the Roman epistle and some of the other epistles. We noticed last week, uh, there was the, there was the, the, the truth of justification is in seed form in chapter 13. And, and here he'll, he'll tell us in the opening chapters of Romans, he'll show that the whole world is guilty, that God has not left himself without a witness. And to these peasant heathens, He's given us the witness of he's given the witness of creation, but he'll show that to, 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 to the people of the cultured, educated Greeks in Athens, he's given the he's given the evidence of consciousness, and he's given us the evidence of conscience, and he'll develop that in Romans chapter uh, in the early, early chapters, Romans chapter two as well. But what I'm really saying is this: that that that, that, that God is really showing that, that that man is dependent on on and his intervention, his revelation in our life, that, that will never, there's none that seeks after God, no, not one, but God has given us a revelation of himself, that God is, and God is, God is good. That's what we learn, isn't it? That God is good, God is good. He'll tell us that God gives us rain. He'll tell us that God gives us fruitful seasons. He'll tell us that God fills our hearts with food and gladness. Aren't we? You know, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variables, neither, neither uh, cast by, by turning. And think of all that God has given us. You know, you think of the rain. You know, there, there's, there's laws of nature, isn't there? Uh, we see that, you know, in the whole uh, planets, the planetary system. The, 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 we think of the sun and the moon and the stars and and we just think of how that they, they are all, you know, the, there's laws that govern them and governs the, uh, the tilt and governs the spin and, and all the rest of it. And it's all, it's all identifiable. It's all measurable. But, you know, we think of the rain and, you know, we don't know when the rain is going to come and we don't know when it's going to go and we don't know how, how, how heavy it's going to be. We don't know whether it's just a passing shower or whether it's going to cause floods. And, you know, it's all in the hands of God, isn't it? It's all in the hands of God. What does the psalmist say in Psalm 147 in verse, verse 8? He says, he covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth. Isn't that wonderful? He prepares rain for the earth. You know, he knows exactly when the earth needs its rain, and he's got that prepared, and he gives us it. He gives us it. Not only does he, not only does he, he, he give the rain, but he gives us the harvest, seed time and harvest. That was the promise in the Noahic uh, covenant way back in Genesis know that there would always be seed time and harvest and it always has been and always will be seed time and God is making provision for people on earth and then he says he fills our hearts with food and gladness joy and comfort arising from the supply God's loving gracious supply of our constantly recurring needs the proof of God's ever watchful goodness towards us and so Paul, Paul is really saying, listen, God has demonstrated that he is. He's demonstrated that he is good. And the God who is, and the God who's good, and the God who gives is the God who can quite easily withhold temporarily or permanent these gifts from men. And it says that with these sayings, they restrained, they scarcely restrained the people. And you know, the wonderful thing is that there in Lystra, in these strange circumstances, there was a work of God. There was a woman called Lois there in Lystra. And she had a daughter who was called Eunice. And she had a son that was called Timothy. Amazing, isn't it? Why did Paul turn and make his way into the heartland of Turkey? Why did he not go in another direction? Directed by the Holy Spirit, he made his way up the mountain pass and into that wild country among a savage people. And he went in order that he might present the gospel that Lois and Eunice and eventually young Timothy might get saved. And Timothy was, of course, a companion of Paul in his later missionary journeys. And Timothy was used by God mightily 
as an elder, as an overseer, as a servant of God among the people of God in Ephesus and elsewhere in days to come. The purpose and the plan of God. And Paul was conscious of the necessity to move in the course and current of the divine will. He wasn't governed by any mission board at home. He wasn't governed by any other higher authority than, than the God himself. And brothers and sisters, that's where we need to be in our service, governed by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Spirit, and emboldened by the same Spirit that emboldened Paul to take the gospel into these wild regions of modern-day Turkey. Let's just pray. Again, our Father, we just bear in your presence. We just give thanks for this time together. We thank you for all that have joined us in the call. We just pray that each of us would feel the challenge of these words uh, that we have pondered together. We just think of God of, uh, we just think of uh, the call to missions. Uh, we realize that maybe that's a call that has uh, just become watered down. It's become kind of ignored in these days. And Maybe as churches, we become very insular and we, we can become very concerned with, with ourselves and, and just the growth of our own uh, local churches and concerned just about our own immediate community. But we just pray you would help us to lift our eyes and to look in the fields and just to see that they're white, ready to harvest and, and that we would call, that we would lay hold upon you to send forth labourers into the harvest field. Uh, that there are many, of oh God, people that have never heard the gospel uh, people of God that are living in lands where uh, the, the gospel is hated, where the Christian Christianity is, is hated, uh, and yet we place you that there are individuals who have that courage to move into lands like that. We pray there may be many others that would take the gospel into unreached places and be prepared to hazard their life for the sake of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So we thank you again for all that are with us. Just bless your word and challenge us. Help us if, even in our own communities just to have that courage to uh, speak forth the gospel, uh, regardless of God of the uh, impact it would have or God, any adverse effect. Help us to be prepared uh, even just to suffer for the Lord Jesus, to be prepared to, to, bear, to bear reproach for his name. We ask these things and we just give thanks again for all your grace and goodness to us in Jesus' precious name. Amen.